Welcome everyone to our Sunday worship. If this is the first time you've joined us, my name is Paul Coburn and I'm the Superintendent Minister of the Sleaford Methodist Circuit. If it's not the first time you've joined us, you're still very welcome. And I, I want to begin with a, a kind of apology. If you've been watching these videos over the last year or more, you may have noticed that uh, in the more recent ones, there's been less elaborate uh, pictures or video trickery or anything like that. As more churches are returning to worship, as the, the round of meetings and events have, have started up again following that time of lockdown, uh, I'm finding that I don't always have the time to do anything much more complicated than just talk to the camera and... Uh, play a few hymns and, and that's it. So I apologise if they are not so quite uh, full of pizzazz as they may have been in the early days. But there we go. You are still welcome and we are here to worship. We're here to, to turn our thoughts to God. So we begin with a, a hymn. Uh, oh, how blessed the hour, Lord Jesus, when we can to thee draw near. Let's sing together. If you're wondering about the background behind me, uh, this week it is Billinghay Methodist Church that we are seeing uh, as you listen to me. Let us pray. Lord, we praise you for the way you make yourself and your love known to us in Jesus for the gentleness of Christ, which still brings us your mercy, for the way his readiness to reach out and touch the lives of others reassures us of your presence and power. We praise you for your commitment to work for our good, which we witnessed in his utter determination to make people's lives whole. Father, we praise you for your free grace, which found its echo in Christ's acceptance of every person who turned to him for forgiveness and healing. For your anger with everything that spoils life, 
and robs us of the joy you meant the gift of life to be. Lord, we praise you for your undiluted purpose for your people, your never-ending grace for all humanity, for your triumphant love, which was given its fullest demonstration in Christ's dying and rising for us. We praise you for that love which still flows from the empty cross and the empty tomb to bring us hope and healing and wholeness today in the name of Christ who makes us whole. Amen. Our reading today is one of the set readings. It's the set gospel reading for this particular Sunday. And I'm not quite reading as many verses as our set. Uh, I'm reading Mark chapter 10 and verses 2 to 12. The verses which follow would have been easier to preach on, but no, I'm, I'm going for Mark 10, 2 to 12. I should point out before I read that long ago I really upset a lady in the congregation by reading this, not by what I said afterwards, but just the fact that I read this passage of scripture because she was um, a divorcee and felt that this was getting at her. I don't read it now with the intention of getting at anyone and I hope I have some positive things to say about it, whoever you are, whatever your marital status. So here we go, Mark 10, verse 2. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you? He replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a, certif a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Thanks be to God for his word and may he help us now to understand what he's saying to us through it. I want to pick up three themes or three things to say about adultery, about divorce, and about marriage. And then after a little break, uh, I, I want to look at those same three ideas again in terms of our relationship with Jesus. But first of all, adultery. What is adultery? Well, I think we all probably know more or less what it is, being unfaithful to one's husband or wife and sleeping around elsewhere. But Jesus has a, a, a more unusual definition, uh, or at least something that, that he includes in adultery, and that is when a divorced person remarries. At the same service long ago that I upset a lady by reading this passage, a different lady uh, confided to me afterwards that her view of marriage was very much based on the words uh, that this passage ended with, and that marriage was for life. We promise to marry till death us do part. And I'm not going to talk about 
being widowed and remarried, that's a different thing. That's uh, we are parted by death. But, but for this lady, marriage was a lifelong commitment. And you couldn't just divorce somebody and marry again because that would be adultery, according to Jesus. In other words, everybody got one shot at marriage. And if it didn't work out, okay, you could separate, you could even divorce. But somehow in God's eyes, it was too late. You were already married and any other relationship would be counted as adultery. That's how you could interpret this and it's how one particular lady did interpret it. But as I read the passage this week in preparation for this Sunday, it struck me that that's not what Jesus is saying at all. I suddenly saw it in a slightly different light. Let me illustrate with um, the, the commentary on a rugby match. I, I'm not a rugby fan. I don't know a lot about rugby, but I hope I, I've got it right enough that this makes sense. Imagine a commentator um, commentating on a particular match and he's been impressed by one of the players. And he said that what impressed him was uh, the way he dodged a defender and scored a try. If you'd heard that, or if you now hear me saying that, you don't in your mind imagine that in the rugby match, the, the player dodged the defender in the first half and scored a try in the second half, and the two things were entirely unrelated. If I say I was impressed by him dodging a defender and scoring a try, you think I'm talking about the same incidents. It was all part and parcel of the same thing. As I read this passage this week, it suddenly struck me, that's what Jesus means. He's not talking about someone whose marriage had failed and who had divorced and then in years to come had found someone else, fallen in love again, and remarried. No, he's talking about someone who basically trades in their partner for a better model. Someone who says, no, I, I don't like my wife or my husband anymore. I'm going to get rid of that one, get another one. And Jesus is against that. That's what he's calling adultery. When you uh, are no longer faithful to your wife or husband, but throw them over for another person. The people who Jesus was addressing perhaps thought, well, it's okay though, if you, do, if you get a divorce, that, that makes it all right, doesn't it? Yes, I, I've not actually gone outside my marriage. I, I've stopped the marriage in order to marry someone else. But Jesus is saying, no, that's not all right. You can't do that. When you are married, you are committed to that person and must stay faithful. But he does admit, coming back to the first bit of the passage, that it doesn't always work out. That because of what Jesus calls our hardness of heart, we, we, we are fallible human beings. And with the best intentions, and marriages always start with the best intentions, it doesn't always work. It may be that you discover things later on that you didn't know about. Maybe you find you're in a, an abusive relationship. Maybe there's just a total incompatibility and it's just not working. And there has to be some way of acknowledging that and dealing with it. And therefore, Moses in the law of the Old Testament did allow for uh, divorce, for a marriage to be to be brought to an end, a certificate to be written out and, and, and um, brought to an end. Now, this year, earlier this year, the Methodist Conference received a report about marriage and relationships. And although 
a large part of the, the discussion about that has been to do with same-sex marriage, and I'm not going to go into that today. Uh, there were many other things in that report, including divorce and what our belief is as a church about divorce. And one of the intriguing things that has come out of that is that uh, the uh, a, a, a subcommittee within Methodism has been tasked with the, the idea of producing a liturgy for divorce, which might sound at first glance a, a kind of a bad thing and almost a comical thing. You, you certainly could turn it into a comic sketch with a, a vicar and the, the two couples, uh, the, the couple there and uh, saying, you know, do you, Arthur Bloggs, uh, forsake this woman? Do you reject her as your wife? Will you promise not to love her and uh, not to give yourself to her? And, and the man says, with God's help, I will. And do you so-and-so promise to reject this man? And you could, you could turn it into a, a, a comic thing. I don't think that's what the Methodist Church is planning. I hope not. Um, but it does seem to me a good idea to recognise that when we marry in God's eyes and we, we make all our vows before God, if it doesn't work out, then th there is something to be said for bringing that back to God and acknowledging that before God too. I did have early in my ministry a, a, a case where a, an older couple uh, wanted to get married in church. They'd been together for many years by then, uh, but they wanted to get married. The, the problem was, or the issue was, I should say, they both had been married before and their present relationship was the cause of the two previous marriages breaking down. It had happened so long ago that there was no way we could reverse time and, and go back on that. There was no way that those two previous marriages could be mended and put right, even if the couple wanted to break apart their current relationship, which they didn't want to do. They were in love with one another. But what impressed me was their honesty. And I, I said I would think and pray about whether I felt comfortable in, in marrying them in those circumstances and decided I, I would, but I would like to have a, a, a prayer of confession, of repentance and declaration of forgiveness right at the start of the ceremony. And they weren't just happy with that. They, sorry, they weren't just willing to go along with that, they were happy with that. They, they actually were quite keen that we did that. And I, I tried to find sensitive words and not make a, not make a big song and dance about it. Um, but nevertheless, we, we began by acknowledging the past and the fact that things hadn't gone right in the past. There were things that were to be regretted and were failings. Um, errors, mistakes, sins even. I can't remember the exact wording we used, but we sought God's forgiveness. We wanted to, to, uh, to put things right and be able to start again. And actually the couple found that really, really helpful. It actually put an end to many years of, of guilt that they'd struggled with and they were able to start again a relationship with God uh, based on a, a new beginning. So whatever this liturgy for divorce is, I, I hope it will allow people, probably not as a couple, uh, but an individual going through a divorce, to somehow acknowledge that before God and, and seek forgiveness and seek a, a new start, a new beginning in, in, uh, in life. But coming back to the, the third thing I wanted to talk about, and that's marriage itself, Jesus uh, and, and uh, his saying here is often quoted in a marriage ceremony. Uh, the words may seem very familiar. Uh, let me remind you again, or at least this is in the, the New International Version. Uh, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh so they are no longer two but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, 
let no man put asunder is the older translation. What I found intriguing about this is that uh, when we try and base our idea of marriage on the Bible, this is one of the, the passages that we turn to, but actually uh, th there are many passages about marriage in the Bible that we rather overlook. This talks about two becoming one. I'm not going to dwell on the gender of those two, uh, as I said earlier. So that's an, another issue for another time. But it's about two people joining together. And marriage is certainly something that in this day and age we believe is between two people. If you look at the Bible, that wasn't always the case. Look at the, the story of Jacob, the ancestor of the, the race of Israel. In fact, they were named Israel after him because he was given the name Israel. And so the children of Israel were literally his descendants. He had famously 12 sons and some daughters as well who don't really get a, a good enough mention. But he, each of his sons was born from four different women, two of them wives at the same time, not one died and he remarried. He married two people at the same time. And then the, the two uh, maidservants of his wives also were mothers of his children. And there's nothing in the Bible that, that condemns Jacob for having two wives. King David, great king, looked up to and admired as, you know, this was the peak of, uh, of, of Israel's history, the golden age of, of Israel when David was king. And he had many wives. The, the whole business with Beersheba, which you might remember, where he sees her uh, and, and falls for her and has her husband surreptitiously killed, that's, that's condemned by God through his prophet. It, it's roundly condemned. David definitely did wrong. But what is condemned there is the fact that um, Bathsheba was another man's property. Uriah was her owner uh, and and it was David who stole a, a wife from another man um, that that was the great sin not the fact that he married when he was already married which he was uh, that's not uh, a problem at all the Bible is full of people who had more than one wife and even in the New Testament at one point Paul suggests that it's a good idea for bishops to be the husband of only one wife, well, that suggests the fact that he had to say that, that even within the Christian community in the early church, it was possible to have more than one wife. So it's unusual uh, in this day and age that we, we just focus on two. If we were going from the biblical example, we might consider more. Now, I'm not going to advocate changing the law, I think, Two is plenty in a marriage, and, and it's quite right and proper. There's something good about it being a marriage of two people. But perhaps the thing that we should focus on, and the thing I want to focus on now, is not the two bit, but the one. The two become one. They become one flesh. Marriage is about people joining together and becoming one. That's the ideal of what marriage should be. Sadly, it doesn't always work, and hence we need to have uh, laws that allow for divorce. But at its best, it is two people becoming one flesh. They may have two literal bodies. They may have two minds. They may not always agree with one another. But that happens even within one person. I have thoughts that contradict each other. Sometimes I, I'm in one mind and sometimes I'm in another mind, but I, I come to terms with that. I, I work it out, what I'm going to do based on should I do this or that, and I, I debate with myself and come to a decision. You do that in marriage as well when you disagree. You uh, talk between yourselves and you come to uh, a, a mutual decision. But 
that marriage is all about one body, one flesh. All I am is yours. All you are is mine. It, it's a, a, a really close union. It's not just about being nice and friendly with each other, but a, a real union. And if, if that's what marriage is, and if it's done correctly, then it's a real joy in life. I should say that uh, single people also find joy in life. And uh, I, I'm not suggesting that marriage is for everyone, but when it happens, it's not a, a lessening of yourself. It's not that you only become half a person, but that unity actually makes you more than you were on your own. Becoming one flesh is what marriage is all about. I did say I was going to apply some of this thinking to our relationship with Jesus, and we'll do that in a moment. But first, we're going to sing again. And I, I thought we'd sing, um, Oh, Perfect Love, All Human Thoughts Transcending. This is actually a, a marriage hymn. Uh, and although uh, I don't suppose... Uh, the moment any of the people watching this are in the middle of a marriage or maybe you are contemplating marriage uh, but we we can sing this in thanks to god for his love but also perhaps remembering those who are married and giving thanks for the the love between two people that brings them together in that way so let's sing oh perfect love <laughs> I've tried to unpick some of the thoughts in the reading from Mark's Gospel and apply them to human marriage, talking a bit about adultery, divorce, marriage. But I want to apply those same principles to our relationship with Jesus, starting with this idea of becoming one. The two become one flesh. The, the image of Jesus as the husband of the church is a, a, a common biblical one. It appears in several different places. Jesus as the bridegroom, the church as the bride. And the love for Jesus uh, and the church is, is compared to the love of, within a, a marriage. But it's not just about the love we have for each other. It's, it's a close relationship that is like becoming one flesh. 
In other places, uh, we read of Jesus uh, our, as our, our brother. We are adopted uh, sons and daughters of God the Father, and that makes Jesus, the Son of God, our brother, part of the family. Again, the idea of being one, as, as one flesh. That's what being a Christian is about. It's not just that we are disciples of a master. We are that. Jesus is our Lord, our master. We are his followers. But it goes deeper than that. When you commit yourself to Jesus, as he has already committed himself to us, then we become one flesh. He lives in us. We live in him. It's one of those paradoxes. And perhaps the closeness of a married couple helps explain it, how, how it is possible to have two who are one at, at the same time. We are one with Christ. We, we have him living in us. We live our lives in him. In one sense, we become his flesh. He has no literal flesh living on this earth anymore. We are his hands, his voice, his feet. He works through us to do things in the world. It's that close a relationship. And just as the, the oneness between a married couple can bring great joy, it brings great joy when we have that oneness with Christ. It may or may not help to think of uh, our relationship as marriage, but certainly the, the idea of the, the unity between us and Christ being as close as a married couple of one flesh, that's what it's all about. Sadly, it doesn't always work like that. Sadly, we are human and we get things wrong. And at times we, we, we struggle with that relationship. And that's why we are given permission to not divorce, but start again. When we realise we've got it wrong, when we've realised we've grown apart, we've gone astray, we've, we, we've spoilt that close relationship, we have the chance to say, it's okay, we can start over. In a marriage, you divorce one person and that will enable you to start again at some later stage with another person. With Christ, we're not divorcing him to start with some other saviour, but we do have that same opportunity to, to put the past behind us and start over. And that's the great thing about our relationship. Jesus came ready to forgive. When we go astray, he's there to forgive. He's there to say, oh, that's okay. Let's start over. Let's begin again. The past can be forgotten. Sins can be forgiven. The slate wiped clean. That's the wonder of forgiveness in Christ. Every day we can start again. Whatever we did yesterday, that's okay. Whether it was good and something to build on, or whether it was something that we'd rather forget and say, okay, can I start again, please, Lord? We have the chance each new day to begin a new life with Christ. The one thing we should not do is, as Jesus described when he talked about adultery, giving Christ up in order to go off with someone else. In the Old Testament, God was forever, it seems, complaining that that's what his people did. He'd done so much for them, rescued them from slavery in Egypt, given them a land, given them uh, kings uh, to look after them who sometimes got things wrong and needed forgiveness. But he, he did so much for them to, to bless them. And yet they were very quick to abandon the God that had brought them out of Egypt and worship other gods. They were very quick to, to be attracted by you know, the gods of the local community. Uh, even as, as Moses was receiving the Ten Commandments, the people were busy 
building a golden calf and, and saying this is going to be our God from now on. Much more glittery, uh, much more expensive than, than this real, really nebulous God that we, we don't quite know who he is and Moses is up there with him on the mountain, but he's not here. The golden calf's here. We'll worship the golden calf. And of course, Moses is furious. Of course, God is furious. He, he, he treats this really seriously. Um, the, the word adultery is a strong word and an emotive word. And it, it, it's that kind of strong emotion that comes across from God. He, he hates to see his people leaving him and going elsewhere because there's no life elsewhere. This is where we find life, in Christ, in God our Father. Why should we go looking after, looking for other, other pleasures, other ways of, of getting life, other ways of salvation? Being faithful to God is, is vital. And yes, even if we get it wrong, we are welcomed back. Um, we, that's fine. But we should not overlook the seriousness of what it means to start worshipping other things and to let other things take the place of God in our life. Let's stick with Jesus. Let's remember we are one flesh and find deep, lasting joy in our relationship with him. And let's bring all those thoughts to God in our prayers now. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for Christ and for his love for us. We thank you for the chance to be one flesh with him to be so united that he is able to live in us and through us and we are able to find joy in being part of his life. Forgive us, Lord, when we go astray and we look for other gods. Forgive us when we are so easily tempted by the pleasures of this world and neglect you. Forgive us when we behave selfishly and think only of what pleases us. But thank you that we have that opportunity to start over once more. And so now we, we turn our thoughts from ourselves to the world around, and we pray for those in need in our community and in our world. We pray for friends that we know to be unwell, those who are struggling with long-term sickness, those who are frail in body or mind, those who have had accident or injury or faced some temporary disease, we pray for recovery and healing. We pray too for the world in all its needs, for the, the things that disturb us as we listen to or read or watch the news. Lord, heal a broken world, we pray. Bring help to those who go hungry, those who live in terror. Bring strength and wisdom to those in government. Give them compassion for those over whom they have responsibility. And bring our world to a better place where all people can live in freedom, in hope, and know the love that you bring to us is one that we can share with one another. All these things we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Saviour. Amen. And let's join in the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. May the blessing of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you evermore. Amen.